Being someone who grew up in the middle of nowhere most of my life, I can surely attest that there are some creepy things that happen in the good old BFE. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends. It's good to see that you made it back for another episode. Today, I'm going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true middle of nowhere horror stories. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share to hear in a future video, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. Now, sit back, relax, and get ready for these creepy and allegedly true middle of nowhere horror stories that'll keep you up tonight. Don't let them BFE monsters bite. Last night, my boyfriend and I were driving home from Universal Studios in Orlando. We were rerouted a way home we have never gone before, and were traveling basically in the middle of nowhere. My boyfriend's speedometer is broken on his car, and he must press the button to reset the miles after he gets gas. This will be especially important soon. We were driving on a deserted road in the middle of absolute nowhere with not one car in sight. My boyfriend realized we hit the 130 mile mark on his odometer. That means we need a gas, but there was literally not one gas station in sight. I put the search in my phone for a gas station nearby, and we found one. It turned out to be closed. In a hurry, we found another gas station five minutes up the road. This is where the story truly gets weird. My boyfriend thought he closed his gas cap after he filled up, and we were once again driving along this deserted road. We heard a loud bang and realized he forgot to put the gas cap back on. So we are driving around this dark road looking for the gas cap. He finally pulls over and realizes somehow the gas cap is still attached to the car. We get back on track to the other gas station. Out of nowhere, I had a horrible thought about something going wrong at that gas station. I pushed it aside as best as I could because I knew we needed gas and AAA is not an option where we were. We get to this gas station and the lights are kind of on. This road literally leads to a dead end with a gas station on it. The only way to leave this area was to turn left or go straight out of the gas station. My boyfriend got out of the car to see if we could get gas, and the feeling intensified. I have literally never felt like that in my entire life. My stomach dropped into my butt. I have been in very disturbing situations, such as almost being kidnapped twice, being followed home, watching someone being taken away in a body bag after being hit by a car, and even some paranormal situations. I can talk about this sometime in the future, but I have never, ever felt like this before. I saw a white car pulling up the road, and it looked like it was going to make a left. Keep in mind, there is literally no one on this road. He pulls up and notices my boyfriend, and comes back up with his windows down. I found this very strange because my boyfriend has a genuinely nice sports car, and my mind immediately went to panic mode. I started screaming his name, and the man realized that someone else was in the car. He turned left and sped off suddenly. Sadly, I did not get his license plate because of how dark it was. The situation frightens me more than you can even imagine. It may not seem too scary, but it was easily one of the most terrifying things to watch because I did not know if I was going to witness my boyfriend being robbed at gunpoint or something like that. The feeling and thought I just had 10 minutes earlier are what also made the situation even worse. We found a gas station with actual human life around, and we made it home safe and sound. Once I got home, my dad told me that that road we were driving on was famous for many bodies being found on it. I hope no one gets put in that situation. Be safe out there, my friends. Some background information here. I live in a small suburban town in the middle of nowhere. It is a quiet existence. It is an upper middle class neighborhood filled with soccer moms and stuck up kids who play way too much lacrosse. There are churches everywhere. My neighborhood likes to act like they are perfect and safe, but it is not. Nobody wants to admit how strange this place is, and they are particularly good at hiding it. Here are a handful of strange occurrences that have happened. There is a path that some kids walk to school through. On one side of the path are train tracks and on the other side is a small forest. I walk through this path quite often, and I have seen some disturbing stuff there. One time I was walking through this path by myself and I saw something lying on the ground. It was about the size of a basketball and was disheveled and furry. As I walked closer to this thing, I recognized what kind of animal it was. 
Lying on the gravel path was a mutilated body of what used to be a raccoon. It was completely skinned, except for its legs and tail. It had no head. I was shocked at this point, but the more I looked at it, the stranger it got. There was no blood anywhere on the corpse or on the ground. This thing was absolutely clean. Grossed out, I walked past it and went on my very way. The next time I went down that path, the corpse was gone. Another time, I was walking on the path and decided to hike in the woods. A few yards into the woods, there is a clearing where kids go to smoke and drink. It was the winter currently, so nobody had been there for quite some time. The clearing had fallen tree branches all over it. To the side of the clearing, there was a two-foot wooden cross halfway covered by a bush. The cross was made of two wooden planks that had been nailed together. There were more nails stuck through the cross in random places, but were not all placed so that they went completely through the board. It was tattered and stained with what looked like blood. I quickly left the woods and walked back to the path and then jogged home. There is also an unexpected amount of child abuse and drug deals that happen there. This place is sketchy, but it pretends not to be. I don't know, man. There has to be some type of cult stuff that's happening here. Living in the middle of nowhere sounds serene to most people, but from my experience, it's honestly downright weird, it's downright creepy, and it's just strange. I've never really had any sort of supernatural experiences until I moved home. We moved from a city in England to a small village in the highlands of Scotland. It was pretty much in the middle of nowhere. It was a big change and I know some people may be thinking that the experiences me and my family went through could have been due to the stress of moving and just generally feeling unsettled in a new house. But I am convinced it was more. This was about 10 years ago now. And the house we moved into was a detached four bedroom bungalow with a neighbor about 100 meters behind us and another neighbor about 200 meters away. At first, it was just me, my mom, and my sister in the house as my dad had not found a job yet, so he was still working in England and came up to see us every weekend. When we first moved in, my brother came with us for a bit to help us unpack and settle in. He did not permanently move with us because he was about 20 and had his own life going on back home. One day, me and him and my sister were playing hide and seek for ages. Later in the day, when we were not playing anymore, I was lying on my bed, listening to music when I saw someone who I thought was my sister out of the corner of my eye, slowly walking in the hall as if she were trying to creep up on me. I pulled my headphones out and called out, I'm not playing anymore, to which my sister shouted, what are you on about, all the way from the living room, which was the opposite side of my house. I shot up in bed a bit scared, but I assumed it must have just been me seeing things. Once we had been there for a few weeks, I started hearing male voices coming from the living room at nighttime. Two distinctly separate voices having a conversation, but I could never quite pick out individual words or hear what they were saying. The first time it happened, I just shook it off and went back to sleep as I assumed my mom was still up watching TV or that we had left the TV on. It happened the next night, and this time I sat up in bed and strained to hear. We had been watching Supernatural before we went to bed, but I distinctly remember turning the TV off, so I was confused as to why I could hear talking. I got up and went to check the living room and the voices stopped. I felt a bit uneasy because, well, where had the voices gone? But I went back up to bed and did not think too much of it. I heard this almost every night for quite a long time and it really scared me initially, but I got used to it. It did stop eventually and it never felt sinister, I guess. I just do not have an explanation for it. We lived in the middle of nowhere and our nearest neighbors were an elderly couple, so it's not like it was them talking outside a window or anything. I didn't really have any more supernatural experiences myself. The only things of interest to note is that I had started having sleep paralysis whilst living in the house, and when my mom's friend, who claims to be a medium and a psychic, came to visit, she stayed in my room and said she had extremely vivid, lucid dreams, and one night, she could see animals crawling around my room, like squirrels up on the wardrobe and things like that. For some reason, this really creeps me out. My mom says that one night she was the last person awake and was sitting in the living room. She had not closed the curtains because it was the summer, and we liked looking out at the forestry around us, and no one was around to investigate our house anyway. 
That was one of the perks of being in the middle of nowhere. She says that suddenly, she saw a strange creature in the garden. It was about the height of a deer, but its face was kind of feline with arched pointed ears, and it was super pale, almost white. She blinked and it was gone, so it could have been one of those blurry things you see, but the details are so specific for something you just catch a fleeting glimpse of. Lastly, one time when my brother stayed with us, he swears that he saw the outline of a face pressed against the outside window looking in. My dad and sister never experienced anything apparently and I have not experienced anything since we left the house except for sleep paralysis, but that's not technically related to anything. The only other supernatural thing I experienced was when I was younger, and we still lived in England. It was in our downstairs bathroom, and we heard my mom call from upstairs. It sounded like she called my name and was asking me to come to her, which I thought was weird because my family all use different nicknames for me, and I very, very rarely get called by my actual name. When I came out of the bathroom, I started going upstairs and said, Coming! And my mom popped her head out and said, What do you mean? And I said you called for me downstairs, didn't you? And she said she did not. We both assumed I was hearing things or whatever, but I don't think I was. I still get creeped out thinking about these stories, what happened, and what could have been causing all those voices and sounds. Hey, Swamp Folk. Sorry to interrupt these stories, but today, this episode is sponsored by Audible. Now, I'm sure most of you know what Audible is, but if you don't know, let me explain just a little bit. Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment all in one place. Honestly, you're going to find the world's largest selection of audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers and new releases to memoirs, languages, business, motivation, horror, crime, everything you could ever want is all in one place. They have thousands of popular binge-worthy podcasts, including my own, all in one place. Recently, I've been enjoying Audible and listening to one of my favorite books, If You Tell, by Greg Olson. It's a 2021 Audi Award nominee for Best Nonfiction Book. Do be warned, it is a pretty graphic book, and if you're into true crime, I think you're going to enjoy it. And with thousands of titles and audiobooks to choose from, there's something for everyone here on Audible. So what are you waiting for? Join me and millions of others over at audible.com slash swamped, or text swamped to 500-500. Visit audible.com slash swamped, or text swamped to 500-500. You can also find a URL in the description down below. Now, back to the stories. I'm a female, and this happened when I was incredibly young, sometime around the age of 14. My life had gone haywire, and I did not spend a lot of time at home. My parents had filed for divorce, during which time my mother had kind of lost it, and had allowed me to do pretty much whatever I wanted, since she was going through plenty in her own life. Then, my dad suddenly moved back in, and that all came to a screeching halt, and I was not too cool with it. So my reaction was to stay gone doing whatever I wanted to, just as much as I wanted, which ended up getting me quite literally thrown out of the house permanently, but that is a whole other story. So I had two friends that I hung out with normally, that was about four years older than me, and had just graduated high school. At the time, I think I was still lying to them about how old I was. They were both 18, and at the time I told them I was 16 when I was only 14. Anyway, we planned a camping trip without any definite destination, but being that we lived in Colorado Springs, the mountains, and vast possibilities for potential camping spots were only a hop, skip, and a jump away. So we headed west into the mountains, in two separate vehicles, and with several other people. One of which was this gigantic guy that I did not like much, and he always gave me the creeps, and since this was 25 plus years ago, I cannot honestly remember his name, so we will just call him Brian. So about halfway up the mountain, one of my two friends realizes she left something important back home and needs to turn back and go get it. So me and my other friend and our carload of people, including Brian, continued our way up. We make it to the middle of nowhere in the mountains and still have no clue where we're going to camp. So we are wandering around in the woods on dirt roads with civilization a distant memory. Suddenly, our car breaks down. And to make matters even worse, right around that time it begins to rain. But since we were already prepared to camp, that is what we do overnight. Brian is sitting next to us the next morning and randomly pulls out a handgun and says he stole it from the parents of one of the girls that are in the other vehicle. Brian goes from being creepy to downright scary. 
Because not only does this guy seem to have a noticeably short fuse, but now we are dealing with somebody with a short fuse who is armed with a deadly weapon, and we are stranded with him in the middle of nowhere. So we all decide without Brian that we should watch what we say to this guy and try to keep him from blowing a fuse on us. All of us now muddy and dirty from setting up tents in the rain on the side of the road decide we should not just sit here and hope that the other caravan returns and is able to find us. So, we pack up our gear and get back to the road and wait for someone to pass, and not a soul does. So we start walking, all four of us, and all of our camping gear, until we make it to a paved road. After an hour or two, a truck finally comes into view on the highway. We all flag him down. We explain what has happened and ask for a ride to a phone. The guy graciously loads us all and our gear into the back of his truck. We finally make it to a phone and call our friend, who tells us for some reason, I cannot remember now, that she had decided not to go with us and to stay in town, but she does agree to come to where we are to pick us all up. When we all finally make it back, the friend that came to get us tells us that she had spoken to the girl whose parents Brian had stolen the gun from, who had been in the car. She told her that Brian had gone on a camping trip with us because he had shot and killed someone with that gun, and he was trying to hide out. I can imagine that was the actual reason for her not coming but it had also left the rest of us stranded in the middle of nowhere with a killer still armed with his murder weapon. Thankfully though, we finally all made it back to civilization unscathed, alive, and I believe the guy did end up being arrested a short time after that. But man, did I realize that I had been literally stranded in the middle of nowhere with a murderer for three days. It hit me like a ton of bricks when it was all over. I drive trucks for a living here in England. It was one of the only jobs I could pretty much just walk into after being medically discharged from the army, the Royal Logistics Corps to be specific, with some intense back problems. I had tried physiotherapy, yoga, acupuncture, all sorts of things, but sitting in the cab of a military truck for so long had really done a number on my spine. It was horrible that I was basically forced into the same line of work, only in the civilian world and I had no choice but to take a daily regime of strong pain medication just to make it through the days and nights of long-distance truck driving. But that is neither here nor there, I suppose. I had only been working for the company I am with now for about six or seven months when I was driving down this lonely stretch of road just outside of Rotherham in South Yorkshire. There, I see this young woman at the side of the road, bags in hand with her thumb out like she was looking to hitchhike. It is not like I do not see a good few hitchhikers on my routes. They are much more common than you might expect, especially during the summer months when people can afford to be standing at the side of the road, sometimes for hours at a time, waiting for lifts. I never normally stop for people. I have seen enough horror movies to know that you are inviting trouble on yourself if you just let a total stranger into your truck for long distances. But there was something about this girl that had me slowing down and stopping at the roadside for her. I do not know if it was how young she was or how desperate she looked. She did not look like the kind of scruffy, hippie type, or dodgy cardboard sign holder that I normally see standing out there. So there I was, opening my cab door and helping her climb inside. I asked her where she was looking to go, only to have her reply something like, anywhere, just drive. This bothered me a little bit, I will be honest, as I did not really like the idea of having someone just sat in my passenger seat for the unforeseeable future. I'm not exactly the most sociable person, and awkward silences are annoying for me at the most, let alone when it's with some girl that is half my age. God knows what people would think if they saw me, probably that I was some sort of perv or something. So I ask her again, only rephrasing the question so that I make it clear that I cannot just have her sitting in my truck for the foreseeable future, as I would be looking for somewhere to stay overnight at some point. I know it sounds a bit mean, but I did not want to have to properly look after this girl paying for her food, paying for a hotel room, and all that. I had never picked up a hitchhiker before, but they are usually set on certain places that you can just drop them off at, right? So after a bit of awkward silence, and I made it clear that I loathe those, I asked her why she was on the road. She did not give me, honestly, much of anything in the way of specifics, just that she was having trouble at home and needed to get away. I asked her if it was a fight with her parents or a boyfriend or something, and that maybe she should just not run away from her problems, but go back and fix whatever it was, you know, like address the issue or whatever instead of just straight up avoiding it. But she immediately took issue with the fact that I had asked her about a potential boyfriend, saying she is getting out immediately 
and if I had any funny ideas about where this was going, that made the whole thing feel even more awkward. And I reassured her that I did in fact have a long-term girlfriend at home, and that I certainly was not in the habit of picking up young girls from the side of the road. I am basically explaining that I'm not a perv when I see a police car pass us on the road. Nothing unusual. So it barely registers other than for me to make sure I am not over the speed limit or anything. You know, the usual, I just saw a police car, anxieties. But a moment later, I hear sirens behind me, looking into the rear view to see what appeared to be the very same car, having turned around to follow me, with a view to pull me over. I groan, saying something about hoping my brake lights are not out, something along those lines, and slowly beginning to pull my truck over to the side of the road. This is right when the girl in the passenger seat freaks out and starts pleading with me to not pull over. I mean, not just pleading, but she is begging, obviously getting really panicked at the idea of the police officer. Now, this made me feel bloody nervous. What had she done that made her nervous around the police? And how would that reflect on me if I were caught with her? These questions are whirling around my head, and I just tell her to calm down, that I had absolutely no other choice but to pull over. I was explaining further that I was hardly about to get into a high-speed police pursuit on account of a stranger. She burst into tears at that point, just sinking her head into her hands and weeping, but she does not try to run away. Nothing like that. So that sort of reassured me that she had not committed some sort of violent crime, or at least that she was not some hardened criminal on the run from the law. I watched the policeman that had pulled me over get out of his car and walk up to the side of my truck, which also happens to be the side that the girl sat on, as soon as he looks through the window. I hear him say something like, Get out of the truck, Natalie. This obviously has me taken aback. Who the hell was that girl that the police officer were on bloody first name terms with her? She is crying and sobbing, but looks up at the window and screams no through the glass. The policeman mentions for me to unwind down my window, and I hesitate for a moment. The girl, this Natalie, is obviously terrified of being arrested or whatever is about to happen. The policeman then says something over his radio, something I did not catch because the glass is in the way. So to better hear what he's saying, I start winding down the window. It was too late to hear what he said on the radio, but I do hear what he said next. Your parents called again, Natalie. They're tired of you running away like this, and quite frankly, I'm tired of having to come fetch you every time this happens. I suppose I knew all I needed to know from that, but that's when I heard something weird. I looked on in a kind of grim fascination at what was unfolding. She was saying that they're not my parents. Why won't any of you understand that? The girl started to scream. Every time you drag me back there, they do worse and worse things to me and call it punishment. They say it's for my own good, but it's not. It's not at all. She turns to me, pulling her sleeve to show me all kinds of burns and scars up her arm. Ones that were so pronounced and gross that I recoiled in disgust and horror. Please, I am begging you, do not let them take me back. I'll do anything. Please just don't let them take me again. What was I supposed to do? Drive off with this girl and get chased by the police? She could have been mentally ill or something, severely delusional with a self-harm problem, and I'm just going to drive off with her in the middle of nowhere so she can run away from her home or something? Besides, I was terrified. Absolutely terrified. Police backup arrived, and when there was enough of them, they dragged the girl out of my truck kicking and screaming before they threw her in the back of a police car and drove away. I tried my best to get some of the police to explain to me what the hell had just happened, and I expected to get some sort of answer along the lines of my previous suspicions, but they just waved me away, told me it was none of my business, and that I should not have been picking up young women from the side of the road anyway. I still do not know what happened to that girl, and I hope she has gotten the treatment she needs. A part of me wonders if I had helped prolong some sort of horrible cycle of abuse, one which the actual police were complicit. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true middle-of-nowhere horror stories. Wow, this was a good collection in my opinion. These were some creepy experiences. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that truly help keep this show going on a daily basis. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to hit that like button as it helps this video out a ton. The more likes this gets, the more YouTube promotes it in the algorithm. And that's super helpful to us. If you're listening on iTunes or another podcast platform, please give us a 5-star rating over there, because that really helps me grow over there, and it's very helpful. If you're new to the swamp, why not join us and help us expand our ever-growing waters? 
Hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications to never miss a new episode as I upload them almost every single day and all things natural and supernatural. If you guys are on the go and don't have YouTube Premium but still want to listen to your favorite episodes of Swamp Dweller Scary Stories wherever you are, you can download them absolutely free from iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, and just about everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. Thank you guys, as always, for supporting the show the way you do. I couldn't do this without you guys on a daily basis. If you guys would like to support the show outside of giving this a like, maybe subscribing, or even giving us a five-star rating on iTunes, that would be awesome. But you can further help us by checking out the merch store. We've got face masks, t-shirts, hoodies, and much more. One last thank you to our sponsor today, Audible. Be sure to check out audible.com slash swamped or text swamped to 500, 500 Thank you guys again. I'll see you guys soon with another creepy video.